If you visit the National Archives in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., you'll be greeted with two statues. The first one is labeled, Study the Past. The second one tells you why you should do that. It says, the past is prologue. Hi, my name is Bob Fox, and I'm here today in Glenview, Illinois, at the Grove Museum, and we're reliving the American Civil War. So here we are with uh, Mr. Steve Swanson. He's a, an executive here, an authority at the Grove Museum. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Thanks for being here today. You bet. Uh, what's the correct title of... Well, we're the Grove National Historic Landmark. Uh, the name of the Grove came with the Kennecotts when they first settled here in the 1830s, and we've uh, kept it ever since. It's always been known as the Grove since the day they've arrived here. And what are your responsibilities here, Steve? I work on the education programs, the day-to-day -day operations, fundraising, work with the volunteers, special events, uh, a little bit of everything, and, but I, one of the nicest part of my job is uh, running this great nature center because I get to go out and actually collect all the animals that we have here, all the fish and reptiles and amphibians and a few birds and things. Could you tell us a little bit about the events that you have here? Uh... Yeah, we have a series of events. We start out in the spring with a garden show and then we have our, our Civil War reenactment and Living History Days and then our next big event will be uh, our Grove Folk Fest, which is the first Sunday of October every year from 10 to 5 each day. And, so and then we have a holiday craft fair and then Christmas programs, historic Christmas programs. Sounds like you have a full calendar. We do, we do, it's, but it's so much fun. You know, we have a lot of support from the community and our park district, the Glenview Park District, and, and then also from all the different reenactors and volunteers that we work with. So I see here we're kind of in the wild. We're in a nature center. Could you say a little bit about what's happening around us? Yeah, we're fortunate that uh, as part of this property had intact about 125 acres of, of prairie and savanna and wetlands. And this is classic ground for zoologists. Uh, Robert Kennecott did his first collecting here. He was Illinois' first naturalist. And so the animals that we display, are many of them come from the lists of things that he was interested in or wrote letters about, um, which we have in excess of 28,000 pages of letters and documents from his time period. Sounds like he was a busy young man. He was, he was, and uh, led a l number of expeditions, worked for the Smithsonian, uh, was founder of the Chicago Academy of Sciences, a professor at Northwestern University, and then led major natural history explorations. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, it, it's really remarkable because this really was the West at the time Robert Kennecott lived here, um, wilderness area, and much of what is known about the animal life came from him. In, in fact, in front of Kennecott House is where he re recorded for the first time and told about how the prairie chickens mate and boom. And um, he'd put a buffalo skin over himself and crawl out on the front lawn of their house and observe these things that were the first time observed for science. Excellent. I see you're, you're recreating the prairie out in front. Yeah, they always had prairie out there. And um, in the 1920s, when Edward Beck, uh, who was the managing editor for the Tribune, took over the property he kind of uh, put a little three-hole golf course out there and, <laughs> and so we wanted to get back to what the look was like in the 1850s when the Kennecotts were primarily here. Well Illinois being the prairie state that's quite appropriate. It is it is and you know with, with everything that's happening with uh, global warming and uh, or climate change I guess is the more appropriate term and and with um, all the emerald ash borer and these alien species that are attacking the trees we might become the prairie state again very soon. <laughs> very good. Um, you think we could go inside the museum and take a look around. Yeah, let's, let's go in and we'll look at some of the animals we have and happening. things that Robert Kennecott had, had seen also here. Well, welcome to our interpretive center. Wow. And, uh, yeah, this is a really this cool nature something. center. Uh, we display most of the native uh, snakes, turtles, and fish. Um, and we worked from the list that Robert Kennecott had put together uh, beginning in the 1840s. Um, he was here at the Grove, uh, brought in his mother's arms when he was one year old, and, and then really kind of got his classical training in, in zoology here at the Grove and from his father and his father's friends. But you know, um, having an interest in nature and being the first naturalist in this area, everything is new. 
You know, he recorded the first time garter, that garter snakes actually drank water in the wild. The, the science at the time felt because of their mouth structure that they didn't drink water. But he said, certainly they do. I see them drinking it all the time. He collected the rattlesnakes and pondered why that wasn't the national emblem rather than the eagle. Uh, you know, the, the Potawatomi Indians were still living on this site when they built their first log cabin. And so everywhere you look, there were snakes and, and turtles and the birds. Um, he had pet sandhill cranes, and he's the first one to describe their mating dances. And his mother had put up a clothesline with, with sheets on it. When they were blowing in the wind, the cranes went and they danced with it too. Mm -hmm. Here well, we, go ahead. Here we have one of our native snakes. Why don't you bring that over and we'll, uh, we'll show that this was a, a snake that Robert loved to collect in, in southern Illinois. And he really ranged throughout the whole state. This is a, a speckled king snake. And it, it's called a king snake because it really likes to eat other snakes. Um, and he's a great constrictor. Yeah, he's a great constrictor, <laughs> as, as most see. snakes wow. are. But uh, I've collected these for years. Uh, they're just beautiful snakes, very smooth when you touch them. Uh, very gentle. Even when you pick them up in the wild, they very rarely try to bite you. They mostly give a little hiss. And uh, this won't be an exception, hey, uh, will it? But this is a beautiful snake, um, it, and it, it sometimes is yellow on the bottom, uh, but mostly this white speckled look. Uh, some people call it the salt and pepper king snake. And in Kennecott's time, of course, all these snakes in this area were just abundant. It, it's really hard to find any places now where you can see the kind of snakes that he saw when he was a kid. Um, and even when I collected stuff when I was a kid around here, you, you could still pick up a board and find 10 garter snakes under it. Very rare, hard to do nowadays. Well, these... Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> these specimens that you have displayed here, are these Robert Kennecott's or are these rep reproductions of them? Most of, most of the stuff we have is things that he collected that we know about that we've gone out and collected ourselves. We do have some cases um, in the other room where we have actual specimens of his, but our, our historic Kennecott house has a large collection uh, of his items. He was mostly collecting for museums um, like the Natural History History Museum at Northwestern and, and the University of Michigan where he had put together their collection and then later on the Smithsonian and then finally the Chicago Academy of Sciences which he was the founder of. But the Smithsonian tells us he was their greatest collector. He was sending to them 500,000 specimens a year wow. from his expeditions. Wow. Well, here we are at the house. Uh, can you tell us something about it, Steve? Yeah, we've walked over from the Interpretive Center to Kennecott House, and this is the second uh, structure that the family lived in when they first settled here in the 1830s. They were in a log cabin for 20 years, but it was a huge log cabin. It had 20 rooms on it. But then they built this magnificent home, and they moved in here in 1853. And this is uh, Kennecott House, which we refer to it as today. Okay, so why don't we come inside? Well, we're in, in Dr. John Kennecott's family home, and he was um, so interested in education that when he had this house built, the room we're in today was their schoolroom. Even though the family had previously built a schoolhouse uh, on the site and had a, had a teacher in it, they still had a live-in tutor in the house and in the evening taught school to the whole family. And this is the room that they did that in. Uh, Dr. Kennecott was uh, the editor of the Prairie Farmer magazine, and, and he used that position to further education in this country. He was the prime mover behind the Land Grant College Act, which established universities and colleges throughout every state. And just for the sake of continuity, Steve, what year are we talking about? In the, uh, they moved into this house in 1856. 56. Yeah, and uh, it was finished then, and then they got in here. And I don't think the upstairs was quite finished when they moved in. But uh, Dr. John and his wife Mary lived downstairs, and all the slew of kids lived upstairs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Robert had his laboratory up here, and the girls had their own bedrooms. And uh, Robert actually shared a room with his two brothers so that his room could be his little laboratory up here, natural mm -hmm. science collection. Very good. Uh, Dr. Kennecott 
you, you know, this was really the wilderness, and it was it was hard to travel from here into the city. It took all day. Many times they, they would travel to Evanston by horse and buggy and then take a sailboat to Chicago. But Dr. Kennecott spent a lot of time traveling throughout the state and um, badgering the legislature to enact different laws with horticulture. Um, you know, he's the founder of the U.S. Department and the only Department of Agriculture. He was slated to be the first agriculture secretary, but he fell ill. He um, was the founder of the Illinois State Fair and ran the first three state fairs. We think of the state fair now as being in Springfield, uh, the capital, but it really was held in Chicago for the first time. He had his commercial nursery here at the Grove uh, that he ran with his son Charlie, and they had a secondary nursery down in Sandoval, Illinois. But this was just a remarkable family. You know, if you look at the years um, when Robert was, was maturing from 15 on and, and Dr. Kennecott's time, the, the things that they did each year, I would take any one of them as a major life achievement, but here they were doing them year after year after year. <clears throat> and, and we still see the benefits of that, especially in our college system. You know, we went from the, just having a handful of colleges and universities to over 800 after the Land Grant College Act was passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long would it take for, to go from here, their home, let's say to get to the lake on Chicago? How long, how many? About three hours. About three hours. Yeah, so, I mean, going to down to the city of Chicago um, was an all-day endeavor. I mean, with the way the expressways are, we're kind of close to that now some days, it seems. <laughs> but uh, it, it certainly was, wasn't... If you didn't remember to buy something at the store, you didn't turn around and go get it the same day. And there was, no, it. there was no train, right? There yeah. was no train. There was a train finally in Des Plaines. Mm -hmm. uh, but Des Plaines was a, a ways away <clears throat> from here. And, you know, Dr. Kennecott had a medical circuit, and he, he left the Grove. He rode a pony called Potawatomi. And he went all the way up into Lake County and crossed the Des Plaines River and then came down south to Des Plaines, crossed the river again, and then back to the Grove. But it was an all-day trip or two-day trip for him. But even though his, his passion was horticulture, he practiced medicine till the day he died. Well, Steve's brought us over here to the Kennecott Archives building. And what can you tell us about this, Steve? Well, this marvelous building is used to house all of our historic papers and documents. We have an excess of 28,000 pages of letters and documents from this family. They really kind of wrote letters like we talk on the telephone. Fortunately for us, we have those in hand. Our telephone conversations, we think, are, are gone for good, don't we? <laughs> and so um, we used to house our papers in different buildings because of the chance that there'd be a fire. And so they're in a fireproof vault now, climate controlled. And we're, we're just really pleased to have this marvelous building. It, it came through with a State of Illinois grant. And we've done, our staff has done all the decorative work inside. And we've kind of created a Victorian reading room with a photo gallery. And we have over a couple hundred photographs from this family and the, the different families that lived here at the Grove. Well, the work in this building is absolutely superb. And I see by the sign it was done in 2005. Um, and it was all done by your staff people. I it was understand. all done by our staff. From, from the floor to the ceiling. Floor to the ceiling. We cast all the medallions, all the fish, did all the silk screen work and all the um, sandblasted glass work. And, and everything you see in here represents stuff that some of the Kennecotts or one of the Kennecotts was interested in. But um, we're fortunate to have such a talented staff that can, can do whatever really we ask them to do. And uh, the colors were, were kind of a challenge. Uh, we painted the doors blue first, and then no one had an idea what we were doing with the colors. But I told them, look, if you don't like it, $300, <laughs> we'll get it painted a different color. But everyone has really turned out to love it. The blue and the red. Did you have a model to go by, or is it just solely from your own brain? Uh, yeah, solely from our own little research and things and thinking about the kind of look we wanted in here. We knew we'd have all these gold frames on there. Because so. you have you know, cast animals. I have never seen that in any kind of building. Uh, so that must have been something that you invented. Huh? Yeah, we cast them from live animal, or well, from specimens, and so that we Very were good. able to uh, to get what we wanted. Very good. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. This is just superb. One weekend in July every year, there's a special Civil War reenactment. We're lucky because this is the weekend. Hundreds of spectators have gathered, and they're witnessing a small fragment of a much larger battle. Soldiers are now taking their positions along a fence line. They're being given orders by their superiors who are often on horseback. They're using muzzle-loading black powder rifles. 
they're not using any bullets, of course, because we don't want to have a real injury. Let's go and meet some of those soldiers. Here we are in the Confederate camps, and we're going to be talking with three Confederate soldiers. This is Rich, and he will introduce himself and give you a little insight of what it's like to be a Confederate at the Grove. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Rich Sonicus. Uh, in the Confederate Army at these reenactments, I portray First Sergeant Stephen Gregg of the 17th Mississippi Infantry, uh, Company D. I'm also, uh, two of my pards here is Matt Dukowski and uh, Kevin Healy. Uh, we are <laughs> closest to the typical ages of uh, Civil War soldiers uh, back then, um, in their late teens and early 20s. Uh, we all carry, the three of us carry a, a Model 1853 uh, British Enfield, is an English import, and one of the most common weapons used during the Civil War, both blue and gray. Um, our uniforms are uh, of the Eastern Theater. I am wearing one of the typical Richmond Depot issue jackets. This is a Richmond Depot 2 with the uh, epaulets on either shoulder, nine buttons on the front, and Kevin and Matt are both wearing uh, commu commutation style jackets. Uh, jackets that have many variations were made by uh, local towns, uh, families. Rich, I see you have an interesting flag. You want to say a couple words about it? Uh, sure. Backwards, sir. Oh, sorry. sorry. This is a flag for the state of Mississippi during the time of the Civil War. Uh, the tree on the center is a magnolia tree, and Mississippi was known as the Magnolia State. So it shows the. What's the symbolism of the star in the corner? Is that divided blue? Yeah. <laughs> In a way, yes. It helped represent part of the Confederacy. And uh, similar to Texas, uh, being the Lone Star State, uh, Mississippi was also probably used stars in their buttons and flags. And why the red? I don't know. Uh, could it be because when this flag is dra draped and there's no wind, it looks like a white flag, a surrender flag. So that would indicate that it is not a surrender flag, but indeed something far more special. Very good, Rich, very good. In addition to the infantry, the artillery was an important aspect of 19th century warfare. On the battlefield, when aimed at troops, the effect was quite devastating. Now two types of ammunition were used, solid shot or cannonballs, and canister shot, which was basically a tin can filled with all sorts of metal fragments. This was designed to obliterate a line of men. We have to admire the courage of soldiers marching into the face of such power. Rob, I'd like to have you tell our friends at home a little bit about what's going on here and your work as a, as a cannoneer. Well, my role is sergeant and it is to train the men to make sure that they know what they're doing on the gun. Today we have two cannons. Uh, we have a bronze, uh, which was a smoothbore gun, and then we have a rifled cannon, which was the new state-of-the-art for the Civil War. They just started using iron rifles in the 1860. Um, the bronze gun would fire a six-pound ball. They were generally named after the weight of their ammunition. And that six pound ball would travel about 1,500 yards, just under a mile, with a pound and a quarter powder. The rifled engine, the rifled cannons, uh, what made them such a great advancement over the bronze was a little rifled twist, because now they could take a three inch wide, nine inch long, or whoops, I'm sorry, nine pound shell with a pound of powder and they can fire that 2,000 yards or just over a mile. And also the accuracy was greatly, greatly increased. Now how far would a, would a shot go? Well, we could probably, if we loaded it with a regular standard charge, we could probably put one out of the area here and probably over the expressway bridge, which is well, just about a mile almost away. So we could we could send one way out there. 
So when you refer to a cannon mm -hmm. and you say it's a six pounder, mm -hmm. you're really not referring to the cannon at all, are you? You're referring to what they shoot from the cannon, yes. the projectile. Yeah, it's more the weight. The actual barrel weight of the average six pound gun was about 800 to 900 pounds. Mm -hmm. but I guess it was easier to say six pounder. So how much, just, how much black powder would you put behind that shell? About a pound and a quarter. Pound and a quarter of pound black powder to send a six pound well, shell mm -hmm. over a mile. Well, just about a mile. Just about just a mile. About a mile. Wow. Um, Rob, would you tell us a little bit about your uniform? You are dressed uh, in mm -hmm. a Civil War style, but mm -hmm. your colors are slightly different than the other soldiers. Could you explain that? Well, the artillery was considered an elite corps. So we had waist jackets instead of sack coats, which hung down lower. We had more buttons. So it was kind of like a nicer looking uniform. We had these little pillows on the back to help hold up our belts. That was basically because we dealt with a lot of horses. Can, we you, had to can hold you turn around? We can get a close up of that in the back. Oh, the belt? This is a belt. This is to hold up the, the belt on these little pillows, because it would a lot of the men would be riding, ah, or, and the belts I would see. jump around. I see. I was trimmed in red. Or my jacket's trimmed in red to signify artillery. Um, I'm wearing a vest. Not all the men, just sergeants, would have worn a vest. Most of them would have had just a white shirt and a coat. My hat. That's a little different. This is more for the Western campaigns. Whoops. The Western campaigns wore more sometimes a open hat. A lot of the other artillerymen, Eastern and in the West, wore a uh, forge cap, which was a little different than the Kepi. It had more like a bag to it. It all fell open to feed horses. Now, would you explain to our friends at home what a Kepi is? You use that term. I'm sure they oh, would the understand. Oh, the Kepi? The Kepi was a, a standard infantry hat that they wore at the time. It kind of re resembled kind of like a cap or a cap. And it had a leather brim on it. A lot of times it'd have the uh, unit signify signification on top of it. So officers riding through camp can tell where they belonged. Well, as we travel through the camps, I'll point out a kepi and you can see one for yourself. Well, thank you, Rob. Thank you for sure. sharing with us this most interesting facet of the American Civil War. Of course, you're not watching professional soldiers, but ordinary folks like you and me. These people have a great love of the past, and they want to share their hobby with the public. They invite you to witness history in some form other than a textbook. They purchase their own weapons and uniforms, and they practice limitless hours to give credence to what you're seeing. They give up modern conveniences, and they live in the past for a weekend. Soldiers fought bunched together. This is an aspect of Napoleonic tactics. During the Napoleonic Wars, rifles were about as accurate as throwing stones. During the Civil War, however, technology produced more accurate weapons. This resulted in many more wounds, necessitating a hospital corps, which became overworked and overburdened. Now, it was common practice for the doctors in the Civil War to take over any building that could be used as a makeshift hospital. They took barns, they took churches, they took homes, and in this case, a schoolhouse. We're visiting today with Dr. John Watson. How do you do? Uh, how, Dr. Watson? Sir. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your duties here in the schoolhouse? Well, this is a field hospital. We get the, the casualties directly from the battlefield and the, first, the ones that we can, we patch up and get back on the line. The ones that we can't, we'll give them what care we can, whether it's surgical, amputation, we make them comfortable, then when it's available, transportation, a, a riverboat, a railroad, we send them to a general hospital where they can get continuing care that's not available here. After you do your work, Dr. Watson, what was the leading cause of death? 
leading cause of death was actually disease. Two soldiers died from disease for every one that died of uh, bullet wounds. When we hear about the Civil War and we hear about soldiers, we generally think of battles, but we don't think of disease. What was the most common disease that... Uh, Dysentery, followed closely by measles. Dr. Watson, would you uh, explain some of the tools that you use? And I'm assuming that these are all authentic Civil War well, tools. This here is a surgeon's pocket kit. It contains everything needed for surgery. You got your scalpels, your wound probes, your scissors, your tweezers, uh, your sutures, and it folds up neatly to be carried in the breast pocket of the surgeon's blouse. This is a dental instrument. This is called a dental key. It's put on the tooth just like that and then rolled out of the jaw. These are going out of use, however, because efficient dental forceps have been developed, much kinder on the patient. I'm sure the patient suffered quite a bit with a lot of pain. Do you find that the case, Doc? Well, no, because we have uh, opiates to ease the pain. Uh, we have a tincture of opium, which is basically whiskey and opium in it. We have opium pills, opium powder, opium suppositories. Hmm. I've heard a lot about laudanum. Well, what's laudanum? Laudanum is a tincture of opium. As I said, it's opium mixed with whiskey, brandy, wine. They mixed it with whiskey? Yes. Uh, there's a very interesting tool here that I can't really understand what it is. This looks like a funnel. But this, I'm sure it's not. This is an ether cone. It's used for administering anesthetic, either ether or chloroform. This will be placed over the patient's nose and mouth. The chloroform will be dripped onto the sponge until the patient went to sleep, which will give you a 17 to 22 minute window to work. Are you telling me, doctor, that they didn't bite on bullets or bite on leather straps in their teeth? 99.9% .9 of all surgery is done under a general anesthetic. Nobody bites bullets, nobody bites sticks. After you did your surgery, Dr. Watson, what was the survival rate of your patients? Well, that would depend on the type of surgery. And say an amputation. It depends on where the amputation was. Say a finger. That would be about 95% would live. Thigh be about 86% fatal. Wow. And in the trunk, from here to here, pretty near 100% fatal. Nothing you could do for abdominal surgery or anything no, like sir, that? No, sir. We like would that? put them in the shade, make them comfortable, and give them some laudanum. Well, doctor, what did you do about germs? Pardon me? What did you do about germs? Uh, you mean Germans? He doesn't seem to understand germs, disease, bacteria. Disease, I understand. I've been to medical school, but bacteria? Mm-hmm. Little tiny... There, there's bacteria in camels. Hmm. Are you telling me you don't understand the concept of germs? Never heard the word, sir. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me because the germ theory of disease didn't come about until after the Civil War. Well, very interesting, doctor. Thank you for your uh, information. and Thank you for your interest, sir. You bet. Good day. This has been a wonderful tour, Steve, and thank you so well, much you for much. inviting us into your just great, great location. Everyone's always welcome here. And uh, would you uh, tell our friends at home when you're open? Sure. And, uh, we're here seven days a week, uh, 8 to 4.30 on weekdays and 9 to 5 on, on weekends and holidays. Um, one of our buildings is always open. There's always tours going on on the weekends. Um, come to the Interpretive Center, which is the, our main building that's open seven days a week. And there's a little board out there that'll tell you what's going on. But we have right. activities for families and people of all ages. Super. Thanks to Steve and Chrissy, our little snake lady, and all the reenactors. So come on out to the Grove and see you next time on Yesterday Today.